So that's kind of where we are today. Now, to understand how light can actually affect cellular physiology, we have to dive into a little bit of a cellular mechanism. And there's something called a chromophore that exists inside of most uh, species, like bacteria included, most eukaryotes. And what photo, um, chromophores do is they are actually specialized uh, portions of the cell that are responsible for absorbing photons. So light is packets of photons. And we have to have some way to biologically accept those things. And we know of a couple really common ones. If we all think about it, melanin, right? In our skin, melanin is a chromophore. So when ultraviolet lights hits our melanin, we have a chemical reaction that comes that creates pigmentation and we start tanning. So this does exist. It also exists in plants. Chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a type of chromophore as well. It accepts sunlight and creates a, a cellular mechanism inside of that plant. Well, there's two different types of chromophores. You have specialized and non-specialized. The specialized ones you're using right now, which we have ro rods and cones inside of our eyes and allow us to accept photons. And you see down there in the middle, we have three different types of, of cones in our eyes, right? We have reds, we have greens, we have blues, and that allows us to see the visual spectrum. What's interesting is these chromophores either absorb or reflect different wavelengths of light. So at the bottom, we see that the red chromophore in our cones accepts lights at 560 nanometers, and it rejects or reflects everything else so that we can see red when those chromophores are stimulated. Green, 530. Blue, 430. So we see the number starts to decrease as we go towards the blue end of the spectrum or the ultraviolet end of the spectrum, and it's the numbers start to get higher as far as the wavelengths as we go towards the infrared or microwave. Now, speaking of microwaves, microwave is just a continuation of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? And one of the things that we see with microwaves is anytime you put a, a piece of food in the microwave, what happens to the food as you turn it on? It heats. Does it heat on the outside? No, it heats all the way through, even if it's in a container. So microwaves can penetrate different types of aspects. So when we start a little, moving a little bit farther up that spectrum towards the ultraviolet spectrum, we should also assume that those wavelengths that are longer can also penetrate like microwaves can. So that's something we should start thinking in the back of our mind. So we also start to see in the right side of the screen, we have some of the different cells that are in our eyes. Some of them are photoacceptors, which are the types that don't have any participation in senses. And we have photoreceptors. Right? So photoreceptors talk about phototransduction. And when we start looking at receptor-based therapies, we always say that receptors have one job. They're transducers. They take physical, some sort of a physical energy, and they can burn it into electrical energy so that we can experience the world in which we exist. So the phototransduction occurs in the receptors, and then the photobiomodulation occurs in the photoacceptors, receptors versus acceptors. Okay. So when we start really getting into this electron transport chain, there is a target of uh, photobiomodulation, and this is cytochrome C oxidase. So cytochrome C oxidase, when we start looking at the electron transport chain, has a really, really important role in mitochondrial function. It's the last stage in reduction in the mitochondrial uh, transport, electron transport chain before we can produce ATP. So when we say when light hits cytochrome C oxidase, what it does is it implements the, the complex four of the mitochondrial transport chain. And what that does is that takes hydrogen molecules and also when we start looking at O2 molecules, which are superoxide molecules, and that converts it into water. And when it converts that into water inside the, the mitochondrial matrix, what it does is it releases hydrogen protons into the extracellular space. Well, when we start looking at it, that's the first thing that happens is when light shines on this, on this cytochrome C oxidase, it creates hydrogen molecules. And as those hydrogen molecules start to increase in their numbers, we can see there's an influx into complex five, which the end result is ATP. We all know that ATP is super important for what? Life, for energy. However, we also know that free hydrogen molecules are not also the best thing for us either. So in an electron transport chain, we're gonna see that there's gonna be a release of nitric oxide, which, as Dr. Jay was just talking about, is really important for vasoconstriction and dilation regulation, or, or vasoregulation, I should say. But we also know that nitric oxide can have detrimental effects on cellular function as well, too, because uh, it can actually block cytochrome C oxidase. So some of the research thinks the reason why we have this sharp drop-off curve 
or this hormetic curve with uh, laser therapy or bullet mod modulation is because you may exceed the ex metabolic capacity of the mitochondria, which is a term that we've been talking about for quite a while. The other thing that happens is we also have an elevation of temperature. And elevation of temperature is anything in the realm of one-tenth of one degree Celsius has a big change in intracellular pressure. So you start having more changes in sodium, potassium, transduction, and uh, things of that nature. We also know that some of our cells have thermo uh, receptors or temperature-gated channels that can allow influx or outflux of ions. So we have those are the primary effects of this photobiomodulation. We start looking at secondary effects. There's many, many, many. And there's a little bit of a diagram on the side there, and you can kind of go through that. But realistically, what ends up happening is protein kinase has become into, set into place, which kind of create uh, the release of calcium and cyclic AMP, which are signaling molecules in nitric oxide as well as the reactive oxygen species that are produced by the electron transportain are cellular molecules that signal for cellular processes to occur. Everything from immune activation, with, with some of the uh, reactive oxygen species. We start activating superoxide dismutase, which is a really strong antioxidant that pr promotes cellular health. But we also see that the secondary messengers also activate different types of metabolic pathways, not on a mitochondrial layer, but on a nuclear layer, such as transcription, translation, and protein production for cellular health. But there's also tertiary effects of photobiomodulation. And we see here in the bottom right-hand corner, this is from a paper published by Hamlin. And right now, uh, from what I've been able to read, Hamlin seems to be one of the authorities in this area. One of our colleagues here today uh, has a great poster presentation that he did with Hamlin. And uh, Dr. Hamlin works at Mass General Hospital, Harvard trained, and they have a whole department on photobiomodulation there at Harvard. And he's one of the main people in charge of this. And what he found is that the tertiary responses to photobiomodulation mean that you increase more blood vascularization, uh, angiogenesis, synaptogenesis, which is a huge interest to us, right? We talked about superoxide dismutase up upregulation, NF-kappa beta, uh, or an, a big anti-inflammatory cytokine gets produced. We have upregulation of mesenchymal stem cells, which can differentiate into neural tissue. They can introduce be created into fibroblasts for coll and collagen and muscle and mild, mild, uh, muscle tissue, excuse me. Lots of changes that happen. We have increased lymphatic drainage. Then we get the dissociation of nitric oxide. So we produce it, then we dissociate it so it's not such a harmful chemical because at certain points, concentrations of nitric oxide can also change membrane potentials. We also see increased blood flow. So you see there's primary, secondary, and tertiary, and then there are systemic effects. So before I talk about the systemic effects, there was a great study that was published by Johnstone down in 2014, and they were kind of a little bit skeptical about this transcranial stimulation. So what they did is they took a bunch of rodents, um, MTPT um, rodents, so these are people that they genetically and, and um, uh, experimentally induced Parkinson's disease with, and what they did, and I couldn't find a, a good picture of it, they put tinfoil hats on the, the rats, almost like the people from outer space are coming for them, right? So they put tinfoil hats on them so that the light cannot penetrate the tinfoil and affect their brain, but they shine the light on their body. And what they realized in, in their uh, controlled study is that the ones that had the lights that shined on their brain had the best results with some of their task speed and walking speed and maze test, but the ones that had their head covered with aluminum foil also had significant improvements over the controls. So this leads a little more to question, right? What are the systemic effects of photobiomodulation at ulterior sites? And the place where they actually uh, shone the light on these uh, rodents was actually on the tibia. So they shined it on their tibia. It wasn't on their spinal cord. It wasn't anywhere in the nervous system. It was on their actual tibia. So some of the effects of photobiomodulation cannot be explained entirely by photons penetrating the skull and accessing brain tissue. However, what they have shown is that in 2003, the calvarial bone has really high levels of mesenchymal stem cells that exist inside there. So maybe there is some photoactivation of mesenchymal stem cells. And they also showed in 2011 with Ando that the effects can last days to weeks and potentially even months after the stimulation stops. So there are systemic long-term effects that happen there. 